Here. We now move to questions of the Minister of Environment. And again, we start with topical questions. Could I just take this opportunity, first of all, of welcoming the new Minister uh, to the Chamber and wish him well in his new appointment? And I know I speak for the whole House uh, when I say that. Jim Wells, Mr. Wells. Speaker, could I concur with you in, in congratulating the Honourable Member for Foyle on his appointment? And I understand that I have the privilege of being the first person ever to ask him a question, which I relished. I could ask him about his policy on Rees Muntjac or the conservation of the Great Skewer, or will he sign the Our House Convention? But I won't. I won't. I will ask him. Does he feel that the planning service of which he is the minister has adequate powers of enforcement? Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and, and Mr. Wells, for your kind words of, of welcome and in, encouragement. Plan and enforcement, and sometimes perceived lack thereof, is a great source of, of, to, of frustration to all of us as elected representatives, as indeed it is uh, to the general public. Enforcement is a key priority for the Department, and a number of its enforcement powers have indeed been enhanced over recent years through a series of legislative amendments. Changes have included increased use of improved IT management systems to monitor performance, use of weekly management reports by officers to ensure proactive management of individual cases and the identification of trends, delivery of staff training, and all area offices have a dedicated enforcement team now. My predecessor, Minister Atwood, convened an enforcement summit to consider compliance and enforcement functions and specifically to consider what measures are currently deployed in dealing with enforcement and how they could be improved. I intend to follow up on these discussions to ensure the delivery of an enforcement system that is more robust, more adequately resourced and operates as an effective deterrent to environmental and planning crimes. Mr. Wilde. Well, it's all very interesting, Mr. Speaker, but if the newly crowned minister would happen to delve into his files, he'll find a very thick one marked in a brogue venison. And he'll find a series, a litany of letters from me and many residents about that case. And I see the honourable member for, for West Belfast smiling because he's a world authority on Finnebrook venison. And what that case showed is that if a developer is if the developer is prepared to run a coach and horses through the legislation, he can do so, and the only reaction you'll get from the planning service is, what do you expect to do, do with it? It's already there. I know uh, Finnebrogue venison is something very dear to Mr. Wells' heart. Hello. <laughs> 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 I'm not sure the analogy of a coach and horses is appropriate when discussing a meat processing plant. <laughs> I am aware of the protracted enforcement history on the site involving formal enforcement action by the Department on a number of occasions in response to the carrying out of unauthorised development. This goes back to a time when planning permission was first granted for a game handling plant as far back as the year 2000. I can confirm that the current development on site has received approval. But with that approval came 12 planning conditions, and I, I have instructed planning officials to monitor the site and ensure that these conditions are implied with, complied with. Declan McAleer. Mr. McAleer. Uh, Graham Elgood, uh, Concordia. Um, I'd like to ask the Minister if all of the 11 uh, local government st statutory transition committees have, have been established. Uh, under the, the, the July 2013 guidelines, uh, statute, the statute transition guidelines? I thank the, the member for that question. All bar one of the statutory transition committees has been established, and that is Belfast. That is more down to issues in Lisburn and Castlereagh councils rather than Belfast itself. There have been some well documented. Uh, issues with the establishment of transition committees right across the council areas, where some councils have chosen to ignore the guidelines issued by the department in the selection of members for the STCs. Uh, um, in situations where the councils have ignored the guidelines, does the minister have the power to intervene and reappoint committees? I have uh, issued a directive to my officials to research and find out 
what exactly I can do in this regard. They are currently drawing up regulations that will hopefully empower me to direct the councils to rerun the selection process using one of the three approved methods. That's the haunt, sunt lag, or the single transferable vote in order to secure a proper and proportionate representation on the STCs. This has to be run in accordance with the vote at the last council elections in 2011 in order to fully reflect the democratic will of the people in those areas. And failure to do so, and I am disappointed at councils who continue to fail to apply these procedures, but failure to do so is basically a blatant flout of the democratic will of those people. Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And like yourself, I would like to welcome the Minister to his first question time and wish him well uh, during his term of office. Um, can I ask the Minister, would he consider intervening the attempt to close explorers on the grounds, on the grounds of the lack of an EQIA, the lack of a public consultation and the lack of a financial impact study? I uh, thank the, the member again for her congratulations and welcome and look forward to working with Ms Lowe in her capacity as uh, Environment Committee Chair. I understand that the final decision regarding the future of Explorers will not be made until Wednesday night and it would be premature to comment really un until then. I have, however, asked my officials to meet with council officials after Wednesday night's meeting to discuss the details. I have received quite a bit of correspondence on this issue over the past few days. The impact of this closure will be felt not only by the, the hundreds or thousands of school children who attend here for educational visits every year, but it will also be keenly felt in the local economy with a great loss to businesses, not just where the aquarium is situated, but also in Strangford. I want to thank the Minister for his answer. Um, without proper consultation by the Artsborough Council, would the Minister accept this as a case of maladministration and ask for a deferral of this decision? Well, I, again, I will have to wait until the outcome of Wednesday night's meeting and the discussions between my own officials and Council officials. As regards intervention, I believe it should not fall solely on the Department of Environment. I mentioned earlier the amount of educational visits that uh, take place or, or visit uh, Explorers Aquarium and as well the reliance of the Strangford Ferry on visitors to the aquarium. I believe that we could look at a collaborative cross-departmental approach or intervention, but again, all that will be pending the outcome of Wednesday night's meeting. William Humphrey. Mr Humphrey. Speaker, and I too welcome the Minister to the dispatch box and wish him well as he carries out his work for the people of Northern Ireland. Can I ask the Minister what progress is being made regarding ARC 21 and recycling targets for Northern Ireland? Oh, I thank the, the Minister for, or the member for his question. He's not, not the Minister yet. Hopefully someday so I can ask him a question that he can't find the answer for. <laughs> Uh, ARC 21 is currently in the process of seeking a new location or proposed location. There were difficulties around their uh, planning application on the previous site. However, negotiations are now ongoing with my department to, ask, to find a suitable site for their uh, gasification plant. Being from the FOIL constituency, I am well acquainted with the arguments and debate that surrounds such waste infrastructure. However, I am unfortunately all too aware also of the need for such infrastructure to help us deal with the ongoing problems facing us as we attempt to deal with waste and reduce the amount of waste produced and then sent to landfill. Um, thank you very much, Minister. Minister, if the, uh, the, the progress is not made that you envisage and the timescale that you envisage, uh, will there be infractions for Northern Ireland and what will level will they be? Well, there, there is a degree of urgency with how uh, these applications are processed, and that is due to the threat of infractions and the, the resulting fines coming from Europe. That is why I think it is incumbent 
that we all do work together. We work together to deal with those or address the concerns of those who are objecting to these plants before we face the prospect of real and extremely significant I don't have the exact figures here, but they are extremely significant fines that will have significant impacts on our ratepayers here. Banks. Mr Banks. Uh, following on from that line of question, and can I too congratulate the, the, the Minister on his, his appointment? But uh, since coming into office, has the Minister been briefed by Art 21 in terms of new infrastructure investment? I have not yet uh, had a meeting with Arc 21. I have met with their counterparts who, who are dealing with the plant in my own constituency, the North West uh, Regional Waste Management Group. I do expect to meet with Arc 21 in the not too distant future and have spoken with other elected members on the situation there. Roy Banks. Would the Minister agree that it's vital that uh, the value for money aspect of any proposal is carefully looked at? and that also that uh, the location is carefully selected, and that in determining the capacity of the site, that it will be a, an appropriate size, given the changing uh, conditions in terms of uh, consumer values uh, and new processes that are coming in, and we do not pay for something which is excessive to what our future needs would be? Yes, I would agree. No, uh, it is imperative that, that these plants do represent value for money. So while I have spoken of the danger and real risks involved of fines coming from Europe, and we do not want to saddle ratepayers with those, it is important that we do not saddle ratepayers with a white elephant either. Pam Brown. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I also welcome the newly appointed Minister to his position and also look forward to working to, with him uh, in my capacity as the new Vice Chair of the Environment. Uh, could I ask the Minister for his assessment of the Cotton Mount landfill site at Molusk following the ongoing resident concern over odour pollution? I uh, thank the member for her question and congratulate her on her own appointment as a Deputy Chair of the Environment Committee. And in that capacity, I, I look forward to working with her. As regards the specific question, unfortunately, I am not fully appraised of the detail of that. However, I would be happy to meet the member and discuss it further at a later date. Pam Brown. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that answer. Um, really, I am seeking assurance for the residents that, um, of Molusk that the inspections and monitoring of Cotton Mount site will be increased um, in the future. So I look forward to meeting you on that subject. Sorry, Minister. Sorry. Uh, I can, uh, assure the member that this site will be subject to the full rigours of Northern Ireland Environment Agency enforcement and monitoring in order to reduce or eradicate any detrimental impacts that it is having to residents in the area of the site. Order members. Question number seven. Mr Allister is not in his place. Move on to Chris Little. Mr Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I to extend my congratulations to the Minister. Can I ask the Minister um, whether he would be minded as part of the local government reform to introduce a standardised regional policy of uh, union flag flying on designated days at all councils? I uh, thank the, the member for that question. My predecessor raised flags, or sorry, raised the issue of flags at the political reference group meetings in the context of the local government reform process. And at its last meeting in June, members commented that it would be sensible to give the First Minister and Deputy First Minister's proposals, which are now the Haas talks, space to develop and see what happens in the wider cultural context about flags. Thank the Minister for his response. In, in the event that the, the Haas uh, talks process would not identify an appropriate solution, would, it, would the Minister then be minded to consider introducing a policy? It is certainly something that I will look at. I think it is important to wait at this early stage when we are already facing uh, difficulties in the establishment of STCs and trying to ensure harmonisation in the new STCs that we do not bring an issue as divisive as this to the table unnecessarily. Questions. We may now move on to oral questions to the Minister of Environment. I call Mickey Brady. Mr Brady. Brahain, question one. 
The next meeting of the North-South Ministerial Council Environment Sector is scheduled for Wednesday, the 30th of October, and work is continuing to finalise and agree the agenda for that meeting. It's too early in that process to confirm exactly what that agenda will look like. But what I can do is reiterate what I said at the Environment Ireland conference in Croke Park a couple of weeks ago. Environmental issues such as water quality, waste management and air pollution and their impacts have no boundaries, and we must take a strategic all-island approach to harness mutual benefits, both north and south. The final agenda for the meeting in October will focus on these issues, and I am very much looking forward to working with Minister Phil Hogan to build on the good work that has already been achieved by the collaboration between the two administrations. Thank the Minister for his answer, and I too add my congratulations to his appointment. Could I ask the Minister to detail the cooperation between North and South in relation to road safety? Well, uh, road safety is an extremely important issue, obviously. That is not something that will come up on the, North, on the environment sector of North South Ministerial Council. It is the transport sector. It is, however, something that I will be raising at the transport sector meeting in November. I am currently working on a bill, the Road Traffic Safety Amendments Bills, number one and two. These will look to, towards the mutual recognition of penalty points in both jurisdictions, which is again another step towards good, safe roads on this island. Because while we do share our air and we share our water, we also share our roads, and I think it is vitally important that we work together to ensure that accidents, casualties and fatalities on our roads are kept to a bare minimum, if not eradicated altogether. Mr. Speaker, can I too congratulate the Minister uh, and can I ask him, uh, can you provide the House with an update on the tyre survey report? Thank the, the member for his question. And I uh, welcome it very much. There has been quite a lot of work done in regard to tyres also, and I think it is imperative that we take all steps that we can to deal with waste tyres. I know uh, quite a bit of work is going on between the jurisdictions looking at how tyres can be recycled and reused to prevent them entering the waste stream, if you like. One such reuse would be carpet underlay. I think it is incumbent that we look at these creative ways of doing things and that we do so together. I think it is also important that we tighten up in enforcement and ensure that those who are disposing of tyres illegally, be they from the north and doing so in the south or vice versa, that, uh, that there are severe and strict penalties to discourage such illegal behaviour. Mr Speaker, I would also congratulate the Minister and wish him well. And also uh, pay tribute to the outgoing minister, who I always find to be very fair and sincere. Minister, last week in the Assembly, the Agricultural Minister came under a lot of repeated criticism for the lack of content in her statement and her responses. Um, can, can you, Minister, um, tell us the importance you place upon uh, enforcing all available law on the smuggling of fuel across border? Are you satisfied enough being done? Uh, and if not, or perhaps as well, uh, will you include that in the NSMC meeting for the end of next month? That's a relief. I thought I was going to come under criticism for the lack of detail in my responses. <laughs> Fuel laundering is not one of the areas mandated for discussion at the NSMC environment, but it is an issue I take very seriously. And just before I left office, Alex Atwood announced an extra £1.5 million pounds of funding to pursue waste and fuel laundering criminals, and I am making sure that that money is targeted at the worst offenders. It is vital that we face down organised crime on the island of Ireland, and by doing so collect or protect our clean and green environment. The extra money will mean that we will have more people on the ground visiting sites, checking waste movements, investigating hauliers using illegal fuel including looking very closely at their financial practices and their computer records. I think it is important that criminals and organised crime need to know that we are going to be looking for them. Mr. Boyle. 
Policy RE1 of Planning Policy Statement PPS18, Renewable Energy, does not distinguish between areas designated for their significant landscape value, such as areas of outstanding natural beauty and other undesignated landscapes. Nonetheless, the policy does require that all renewable energy development, regardless of whether it is proposed in a designated or undesignated area, should not result in an unacceptable adverse impact on visible, vis visual amenity or landscape character of that area. To assist the Department in the consideration of wind energy applications, PPS 18 is accompanied by best practice guidance that's BPG, and supplementary planning guidance, SPG, wind energy, energy development in Northern Ireland's landscapes. The SPG provides broad strategic guidance in relation to the visual and landscape impacts of wind energy development for 130 landscape charter areas across Northern Ireland. Within each of these LCAs, the key landscape and visual characteristics are identified. In, rela in relation to the scenic quality of an area, the LCA will identify whether any part is subject to designation as an area of outstanding natural beauty. An assessment is also made as to the overall sensitivity of the landscape to wind energy development. The SPG advice is taken into account by the Department as strategic guidance in processing planning applications for wind energy development across the whole of the North. And could I thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer and wish him well in his new position. But could I ask the Minister, has he any particular concerns about the number of applications that are in the system for wind farms in the Spurns, and how, how this impacts on the landscape, on tourist jobs, and the, and the amenity of the area in general? There are indeed, one would think, on looking surely at statistics, a disproportionate number of wind energy applications in that particular area. Of course, this can be attributed to the landscape itself, which lends itself to greater wind speeds, and also to the increased rurality, I suppose, of that area, which makes it more attractive to this sort of development, i.e. There are less residents and therefore maybe less people uh, to object. Currently in the system, I think there are applications for 16 wind farms, and eight of them are in that West Tyrone area, and quite a few in East Derry as well. So that's something that, that really does need looked at. We are very supportive of renewable energy. We have programme for government targets to meet, and I think it's important that we work together and work with communities in order to meet those targets and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Mr. Watson. Speaker, can I also welcome the Minister to his post? In the interest of transparency, would he perhaps reveal to the House what support his party obtains from the renewable energy industry so that we can ascertain whether the despoiling of the countryside by wind farms, which was the mark of his predecessor, is because of ideology or because of some other sinister motive? I think uh, not for the first time in this House, uh, Mr. Wilson is tilting at windmills. <laughs> I am unable to clarify any support my party or any other party receives from uh, re the renewable energy sector. However, I think it is incumbent upon all of us as elected politicians to support that sector where possible. However, we should not be running rough, roughshod over the wishes of residents, and each application should be assessed on its merits. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I congratulate my colleague as well? And also um, acknowledge the hard work of the previous minister as well. Can I ask the minister to outline his approach to planning applications to single wind turbines in populated areas? I uh, thank the member for his question. The approach to single wind turbine applications is very much akin to that 
to the approach to at wind farm applications they have to go through the same strenuous tests the environment impact assessments and so forth currently there are, are over 700 live applications to deal with uh, individual turbines and unfortunately while these don't just generate electricity they also do generate objections and sometimes rightfully so from residents but it is over the past three years there has been a marked increase in the number of applications for single turbines there's been maybe 900 on average each year for the past three years whereas in 2009 i think there were only 600. Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and given the fact that 40% of wind turbine which have been approved or in the pipeline for being approved are in Western area, do you think um, that there is perhaps a need for a more strategic approach to planning overall? For example, like zoning area so that one area, yes, of course, which has a lot of wind, but that area is going to be absolutely concentrated in building of wind farm. I thank the member for that question and indeed suggestion. It might indeed be something worth looking at. We do not want areas completely destroyed with a proliferation of wind turbines and, and wind farms. The, the member in her question referred to the number of approvals. I think that's another issue we need to look at, where there are approvals granted for turbines and farms, and then even some years later they haven't been able to be constructed, maybe due to a failure to be able to get a grid connection. And sometimes that gives maybe a skewed, a skewed impression of what is actually there on the ground and in the sky. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number three, please. The terms of reference for the study on all island air quality were agreed between my predecessor, Minister Atwood, and my southern counterpart, Mr. Minister Hogan, and received North South Ministerial Council approval in July this year. A procurement process is underway to secure consultants to carry out the research, and I would expect to have an update on this process at the October meeting. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I too join in others in congratulating uh, Mr. Durkin to his ministerial position. Can the minister outline wh uh, why this is concentrated on issues around smoky fuel, uh, including smoky coal, but does not deal with other fuels, including peat? The research study is being jointly commissioned, funded, and overseen by my department and the Department of Community, uh, Environment, Community, and Local Government to assess the current levels of air pollution on an all-island basis. It will examine the significance of residential heating and solid fuel burning, such as smoky coal, and also, hopefully, that will be extended to peat. But I think it is vitally important that we, we look and take into account the social and economic implications of anything that might come out of, uh, of these meetings, and they will also help dictate and form future policy options. Gregory Campbell. Mr. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The um, Republic of Ireland, particularly in the Midlands of, of that country, uh, is proposing to have a massive uh, wind farm to uh, assist with the UK's energy profile. Uh, has the Minister had any discussions, or will he have any discussions, with his counterpart in the Irish Republic to see uh, if that will have any impact on our element of the UK's uh, percentage of renewable energy? I thank the member for his question. Uh, to date, I have not had any such conversation, although I will put it on my ever-lengthening to-do list, and I will get back to the member in writing when I have further information on it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I congratulate the Minister on his appointment and a, a sterling performance so far. Um, could I ask the Minister, um, does he agree that it is important that we have an evidential basis of our air quality um, so that should something like fracking go ahead, we, we have that uh, baseline on which to compare any impacts? 
Well, I think uh, solid evidence is extremely important, and I will use it to inform any decision I make on any issue. You touch on the issue of fracking. That is something else that I am collaborating with my counterparts across the border on. We are sharing information, sharing knowledge, and I think that is vitally important before any decision is here and how we go forward. Mr. Michael uh, can I ask the Minister if he agrees that any move to ban smoky coal will be politically difficult as cleaner forms of fuel are more expensive? And just to wish the Minister every success in his uh, portfolio. Well, I think any move to ban smoky coal would probably lead to them burning my election posters instead. It would be politically difficult indeed. However, there is more science around this. Like fuel is more expensive here than in Britain, and poverty levels are higher, and people are burning smoky coal in smokeless areas to try and combat that currently. But investigations by my officials, and not just by my officials, by right across the board, show that while smokeless coal is slightly more expensive than smoky coal, scientific evidence shows that smokeless coal burns longer with a higher heat output which would actually negate any perceived savings. So I think it's important that we don't just set about trying to enforce this, but that we also try to educate the public around it as well. Old Garvin. Mr. Garvin. Question number four. <clears throat> With your permission, Mr. Speaker, I would like to take questions four and twelve together. Earlier this year, my predecessor successfully bid for additional monies from the Executive to meet some of the transitional costs of local government reform. Whilst local government will benefit in the long term from the reform process, there are a number of one-off costs that will not be met through the greater efficiencies that re will result post-2015. The funding package of £17.8 million is intended to meet inescapable costs with various elements of the transition process during the 2013, 2014 and 2014 15 financial years. This funding includes £5.2 million to establish and run the Councils in Shadow form, £3.5 million for a Councillor Severance Scheme, £0.6 million for staff induction, £3 million for capacity building, £1 million for change management, half a million for winding up councils and four million to cover borrowing for ICT. There is also a further commitment by the Executive of up to thirty million pounds for rates convergence following the creation of the eleven new councils in April twenty fifteen. My department has no further additional monies available from within its own budget. Any additional costs will have to be met by local government. At the inaugural meeting of the Regional Transition Committee on the 25th of April 2012, a range of key reform funding and finance issues were identified for inclusion in the programme of work of the Finance Working Group. One of the key tasks of the Finance Working Group is to develop an up-to-date and accurate analysis of the full costs and benefits of the reform implementation programme. And in order to do this, local government has developed a template and accompanying guidelines for individual councils and transition committees to accurately estimate the costs of reform. The returns are currently being examined and analysed to validate the data, and this will provide an up-to-date estimate of the full cost of implementing reform in local government. Paul Gerwin. I thank the Minister, and I too would like to welcome him. And I congratulate him on his elevation to the post. Uh, in relation to uh, convergence, I appreciate that some councils have been attempting to do a convergence uh, approach between themselves, uh, and those councils are probably going to be probably penalised because of that. And I appreciate that there are some good uh, practices that have been demonstrated uh, in some council areas. What message is going out to ensure that uh, STCs actually do engage? They have known for quite some time that there was going to be 11 councils. Some of them have been sitting uh, in the background doing absolutely nothing up to now, where some have actually been doing that. What message is going out to those councils to make sure that they do engage? I well, uh, thank the, the, the member for his supplementary question. In uh, guidelines issued by myself to the STCs, 
just about a fortnight ago, there were guidelines around financial management and convergence procedures. I, I take on board exactly what the member has said. There are councils out there or, and uh, transition committees who seem to have been burying their head in the sand and hoping that the, the day and hour wasn't going to come, that they were going to actually have to cough up and put money into the pot. But I think it's now beginning to dawn on them that they are going to have to. I think as a department and as a minister, we are going to have to work with the transition committees and with the councils to ensure that they do and uh, make them best able to do so as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I too uh, wish the minister well in his new post? I, I understand in his answers that extra over costs uh, will not be met by his department's budget, but must be met by local government. Uh, and bearing in mind that local government means ratepayers, uh, and that there will be extra costs to ratepayers for this exercise, uh, can the minister not indicate an up-to-date estimate of costs, bearing in mind that all we have to work on at the moment is the PwC report, which is some years now out of date? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank uh, the, the member for his supplementary. Uh, question uh, and take on board again his concerns. Unfortunately, at this stage, I am not in a position to give a fully up to date report on proposed or projected sorry, costs. Again, I think it is vitally important that we monitor costs as they spiral, I suppose, that we continue to work with the transition committees and councils to make sure that they do not spiral too far and again to direct them best how to manage them. Phil Flanagan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers and I wish him well his new role. Um, can the, the Minister give me a figure for the amount from the thirty million to deal with rates convergence that will be set aside to deal with the, the problem in Fermanagh and Oma, or at least can he give me an insurance that a substantial portion of the total figure will go down to that area. The further commitment of the estimated £30 million for rates convergence following the creation of the 11 new councils in April 2015 will essentially protect those whose rates bills may have experienced a significant increase as a result of merging with councils where rates are currently at a higher level. So that will apply wherever it applies. And if it's, I do not think it is particular or unique to the area that uh, Mr Flanagan has mentioned. However, I do give him an undertaking that it will be directed to there, as well as other places that need it. Anna Lou. Question 5, please, Mrs Speaker. My predecessor, Alex Atwood, met with a wide variety of interested parties both those in favour of and those opposed to national parks in his efforts to promote the concept. Like Alex, I believe that national parks have much to offer us, but I am conscious of the significant opposition that currently exists. It is clear to me that the national parks should not be imposed on any area, and I therefore want to take time to consider carefully the issues involved to see if it is possible to proceed with enabling legislation at this time. Hello. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, given the, the economic, environmental, and tourist benefits of a national park, um, as evidence elsewhere on these islands, would the minister be prepared be prepared to to be the champion of of raising a, a national park in Northern Ireland? I am uh, fully aware of the benefits that Ms Lowe has outlined of national parks. However, as outlined in my original answer, I think it would be wrong and unproductive to impose parks in areas that do not want them. As Minister, I intend to work with those in favour of parks and those against parks. In the absence of enabling legislation, should I choose not to proceed with it, I think it is important that we work with all stakeholders to maximise the benefits of our natural heritage and built heritage, the, the things that would make us, maybe in some people's eyes, ideal 
to have national parks, but that we work to maximise that and develop our tourism product with it. Mr. Weir. Mr. Weir. Mr. Speaker, I join with others in welcoming the new minister and wish him the best. Can I ask the minister, in light of the level of opposition, which in many ways I'm surprised that the, the issue hasn't been buried at this stage, but given that the, the principal thrust of the opposition uh, comes most fervently from the farming community, can I ask the minister what meetings he intends to have with representatives of the farming community in the near future to uh, discuss this issue further? Well, uh, my door is open to meet meetings with those, as I have said, in favour of national parks and those opposed to national parks. To date, I do not believe I have a date in my diary to, to meet with the farmers on this. However, I am pretty determined to do so. They were very vociferous in their opposition. It is important that that is listened to. It is also important, I think, though, that the benefits that a national park might have are also outlined to those opposed to them, and maybe so their position on it will become a, a bit more informed as well. I think there was quite a bit of, of scaremongering at the time, and I, I think there needs to be a balanced public debate around the issue as well. Roy Banks. Mr Banks. Would the Minister accept that there is much restrictions already in the areas that are identified for national parks? But it's not just the agricultural community that are opposed it. Many within the hospitality community have opposed it because of fears of additional burdens that will fall upon them. So would he confirm that because of uh, business concerns, both from small businesses and indeed from communities who fear loss of employment from agriculture and from hospitality, that there is concern in many of those areas? Yeah, I recognise that the only concern isn't that of the farmers, and it is shared by others. But that's why, as I've said to Mr Weir, I think it's important that there's a more full public debate. There was a lot of public opposition uh, last year when, when the, there were attempts to bring this forward, but I, I don't think we heard enough from those in support of parks and those extolling the benefits of parks. I think it's only with that information that uh, one can make a balanced decision on how this should proceed or otherwise. John Lynch. Question number six. The Department has issued two sets of guidance for the purposes of assisting councils establish and effectively operate their statutory transition committees. The first tranche of guidance was aimed at establishing the committees and includes direction on convening the first meeting to establish the new committees, explaining the size of membership of each committee, electing members using proportional representation, supporting female representation to improve gender balance, promoting governance and procedures through model standing orders, advising on corporate plans, business plans and budgeting, providing for premises and elections to the posts of chair and vice chair, whereas the second tranche of guidance focuses on operational finance arrangements, systems of internal financial control, advice on assets and liabilities, utilising support staff with particular operational skills, publishing corporate and business plans, information sharing across existing councils and committees. All elements of this guidance are key to the statutory committees driving convergence between the merging councils and discharging their responsibilities under the reform programme. Sean Lynch. Uh, Cam Coyle, yeah. I'm Gorham Gwaker, Slice and Error, Alison Fragerson. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I want to thank the Minister for his answer. I was going to congratulate him, but then I remembered I met him at the Flag Hill. So, uh, best wishes anyhow. Can I ask them, the Minister what plans are in place for similar regulations for the operational role of the new 11 councils? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? <laughs> could the member repeat the question? Uh, Faber B, no problem whatsoever. Uh, can I ask the Minister what plans are in place for similar regulations for operational role of the new 11 councils? Okay, uh, thank the member for the question. I heard it second time, but <laughs> I'm still lost. I'm still lost. Uh, I haven't got that information to hand right now. Uh, if I could get back to the member in, in writing, I will do so. 
questions uh, to the Environment Minister. A point of order, Mr Allister. Right. Uh, first of all, could I apologise for missing my topical question to the uh, Environment Minister? I have no excuse to offer, other than it slipped my mind. Sorry about that. But uh, on the issue that arose during my topical question to the First Minister, can I ask what protection exists for a member in this House when they are the victim of a malicious falsehood, such as I was today, when the allegation was made that I, as a will, executor of a will, had been involved in the sale of land, I think it was put to Republicans, when the truth is I am neither the executor nor the beneficiary of any such will or involved in any such land sales. What protection exists for members so that they are not subject to such false allegations? Let me first uh, let, let me deal with this point of order here first. Um, first of all, uh, I didn't hear what was been said by the member initially uh, when the issue was raised. Secondly, let me read Hansard, have enough to come back to the member directly. But let me say also to the member, and I don't care what the issue might be in this house for members, it is wrong for any member to try and shout down the chair. I had asked the member on several occasions to take his seat, knowingly that it would allow the member in on a point of order after question time. So all members uh, should be very careful in trying to shout down the chair, especially uh, and as clear understanding orders as a speaker or deputy speaker is raised in their place, members should take their seat. And I just would remind all members of the conventions in this House when it comes to asking members to take their seat. First Minister. Further to that point of order, uh, leaving aside the uh, slightly incidental issue of whether he was executor or whether he was the person influencing the decision, he is dancing on the head of a pin if he tries to distinguish between being the beneficiary and benefiting from. Everyone knows he benefited from, and indeed further to the remarks I made earlier, it is particularly sad that a member of the family wanted to buy the, the land and was turned down because the family decided to sell it to a Republican. So it ill becomes him to come into this House and chide the rest of us for dealing with the Republicans when he's doing it. Order, 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 order. I really must insist. Uh, I intend to, to, to cut this now. Order, order, order. I intend to take no further points of order on the issue. Let us order. Let us move. The, the member has had, a, had a ample up. Order. The members ample opportunity to put the, put the record straight on the, uh, to this House, and the members should leave it there. I have said to the member, let me read Hansard, and let me come back to the member, and I will come back to the member. Order, 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 order. I really am not taking any further points of order on this issue, and we really should move on. As he indicated, in terms of the, it was very difficult to make out precisely what was being said. There was a somewhat hysterical reaction. Could the Speaker also check Hans Hart to see if there was any unparliamentary language used uh, when the, the member was up talking and also the, the defiance of the chair? Let, let, me, let, 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 let me see. Well, that, that order, 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 order. That particular point of order was around procedures. And I have already said to the member, I will come back to the member directly or even to this House when I read Hansard. Let us move on. Is it a similar point of order? Right, OK. <laughs> certainly, certainly we'll take the point of order. But it is a similar point of order. When you are reviewing Hansard, I would request you would also review the comments made by Mr Wilson uh, from the back benches in relation to planning approvals uh, for wind farms or wind turbines. And I'd ask you to make a ruling about whether on this occasion he kept just on the right side of transgressing parliamentary good practice or whether he is, uh, as I believe others have today, crossed that line. Let me uh, read Hansard. There will be quite a bit of nighttime reading around all of these issues. But let me do that and let me come back to the member directly. I'll do that.